And now we're going to change topics. I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Serge Ketov, is a maxillofacial surgeon. So he's going to talk about surgery, digital surgery, and I think that's a difference today. From what I remember, all the surgeons I used to work with, in the past they didn't want to talk about computers, they were only hands-on people. Now we have a new generation of surgeons and those surgeons use digital to treat their patients. Thank you very much in advance. Thank you. Oh, just a, an aside, I have something difficult to ask from you is, oh no, okay, okay, I get it, I need to get this done very quickly. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie and their partners for this summit. And I know it's been said before, but I think we need to underline that we were hosted beautifully and it was great to spend this weekend with you. My name is Serge Ketov. I, do, I work with Dr. Ketam. I'm also working at the Saint Joseph Hospital in Paris, and also um, uh, working with the uh, Breton uh, Hospital as a reference uh, surgeon. I'm going to talk about uh, my uh, ortho orthodontic and surgical uh, protocols, and I think that they all start with diagnosis. Diagnosis should be performed with uh, the orthodontist on the one side and the surgeon as well, and this is really going to be the, the, the cornerstone. Now, the transversal dimension is key. If you have more than six millimeter deficit of vertical dimension at the uh, molar level, then we need to start with its junction surgery uh, at the uh, maxilla. This protocol, of course, is a very much uh, uh, multidisciplinary um, with physiotherapists, but also we should have psychologists on board. I think they are key. So what we do as surgeons, of course, is surgery, but planning is key. We spend more time today in planning than in the uh, uh, operating theatre. So if I were to uh, talk about osteotomies, I think there are two categories, the osteotomy only in one arch and those in both arches. So when you have a dental compensation, um, you are going to be in charge of the dental side of things. Now, when it comes to planning, we need to ponder whether we should uh, do uh, genioplasty as well. It really depends on the form, shape of the synthesis, but also depends whether we were able to have a very good decompensation or not. If the mandible is moved forward very nicely, then we do not need uh, genioplasty. We sometimes go for genioplasty if the movement is not sufficient. Usually, we do a B maxillary osteoplasty. So this class one is going to be recreated in space, and those are the uh, criteria for orthofacial surgery. So we need to have the right balance side and profile. profile. We need to correct occlusion and function. There are multiple choices, and I think this is how digital tools can help us. And if I were to summarize the main principle of surgery is that we're going to plan basing the whole centering in the uh, on the maxillary um, central uh, incisors. Now the role of the surgeon and the orthodontist is to agree on the movements, especially if we need to rotate the occlusal plane. The orthodontist is really going to help with the talk depending on what we can provide them with. Now, what we have in common with orthodontists in the room is treat our patient by working on shape and changing cha changing shapes. So we need to start by acquiring a good uh, scan of their anatomy and then use all tools at our disposal. So planning, we start with 2D pictures. Then we, of course, do a clinical examination. This is how I learned. So we start with those uh, paper where we um, simulate the new position of birth shows. And then, of course, you need to transfer what you have on your computer 
on uh, the patient in OR. Usually we use a splint for that. And so welcome in our new world, the world of digital planning with the digital clone, the digital twin. I worked this paper with Dr. Ashush and other colleagues on the digital workflow in orthosurgical cases. And we start with a scan, 3D pictures, um, 3D um, impression taking, but there's also a kinetic uh, uh, registration. So it starts with that, and then with this wealth of data, we plan that treatment. So it's exactly the same thing we used to do in the conventional workflow, just more complex because we analyze more things, more things that were not visible in 2D. So we simulate and have more predictability thanks to those digital tools. In the past, we could see in our head what the face would look like. We could see in our mind what the smile would look like. Now we can actually see it on the screen. So once we have the uh, digital twin, we can simulate the operation in silico on the computer. And then we can also plan to transfer that. This is what we call guided surgery. Guided surgery can be applied in a number of areas, in maxillofacial surgery, but also in the dental field. The most widely used in automatic surgery is a guided surgery, which we call static guided surgery, so with guides. So you have a 3D printed guide. You can have also a splint, or you can have bespoke um, or personalized uh, uh, blades. Dr. Schuller invited uh, the, this technique, and you had a presentation on this yesterday. The second type of surgery is dynamic guided surgery. So you simulated that surgery in your computer, but then in real time, in OR, you can adapt your surgery. They use that very much in implantology, not so much in musculofacial surgery. The third type sounds like science fiction, not completely. It's the um, autonomous guided robot uh, surgery. There was a first worldwide, a lethal one osteotomy was performed 100% by a robot which cut the bone with a laser. So all this to say that, well, this first was in France, so we are also at the cutting edge when it comes to uh, those types of um, surgeries. Now, the tools, of course, are key. If your planning is not 100% accurate, then you're not going to have a good result in OR. So I'm going to present a few clinical cases and a guided surgery. So I'm going to talk about splints. So in the past, I used uh, to use manual tools, but now I have a first screen, my computer, and two screens. So on the one hand, I have the scan, I have pictures, I have all of those data, and then you can see to the, light, to the right the um, 3D printer, and you have everything on the same desk. Now, this is a clinical case. This is an adult patient with a sleep apnea, class 2, B or retreated uh, maxilla. And you can see that she has a gummy smile and side view, a, a retrusion, retreated uh, uh, mandible and maxilla. And you can see also on the radiograph that um, airways are very narrow. Now, this is not easy to have the right digital workflow. So you need to um, have these uh, uh, images done and you need to have a cast one month before surgery. And of course, there shouldn't be any difference between the moment the cast is made and the moment the patient comes to your operating theater. Now, the condyle should be in centric relation and the scan should be performed in centric relation. So when you overlap those different or merge those different data, then you uh, plan your osteotomy um, uh, cuts on the mandible, on the maxilla as well. Now, how are we going to define the optimal occlusion? There are two ways. After with haptic, either with haptics, so manually, we all know and trust. So we take the cast and we define the right occlusion manually. You can integrate that occlusion digitally. Uh, there are two ways to do that. So either you scan 
and uh, you, you, you scan your cars, then the cars are placed in occlusion, and then you scan again. I, I like it, you know, those orthodontists that have those casts, and then they use a pencil, and they put milestones to help you get the perfect occlusion. Um, now, the most modern way to do that is to place your uh, cast in occlusion and then you, sc you, you scan those casts and you send an STL file to us. The other option is to have a full digital occlusion um, definition. Now, of course, you're not going to do that on your clean check. It has to be done on a, a proper uh, scan. Now, this is our patient. We collected all uh, skeletal information. Those are all information pertaining to her skin. And so we are going to correct uh, occlusional plane. You see that this requires a mandibular advancement of 5 mm. However, if we want to help with sleep apnea, you need to move the mandible forward of at least 10 mm. You have a simulation on her soft tissues. And we know that uh, when uh, in this patient she requires a B maxillary uh, surgery. Now, in the past, we used to work in 2D, now we work in 3D, and it helps very much. First, we're going to center the inter incisor point, and then we're going to help the occlusal plane become more horizontal. The third thing we do, which we were not able to do in the past when we work on 2D, was um, uh, in um, inferior, we could have a, it's the yolk. If uh, sometimes uh, they were centered, but then sometimes there was a form of asymmetry. And uh, you may have that. Um, it means that the uh, incisor, uh, the, the medial inter incisor point is centered on the face, but sometimes you have that. Some, it's, it's something that you also have in aeronautics, and uh, you may have enough centering on one side or the other. So we impact the uh, maxilla of four millimeters, and then we um, uh, pr protrude the uh, mandible. So everything has been uh, defined, and we have a number of possibilities to help with aesthetic and function. So this is a B-maxillary advancement or protrusion, and when we do that, we realize, you know, look at the bone, there's a 6.2 millimeter advancement at the level of the piriform orifice. Uh, at, at the level of the nose, it's not necessarily a good thing. We do not want to have an enlarged nose. The 6.2 millimeter is just too much. You do not want to have a nose which really looks like a typical Lefort nose. So we're going to change the occlusal plane. We're going to have a fixed milestone in between both incisors, so the inter-incisor point is static, but what I'm going to change now is the occlusal plane. So thanks to this uh, uh, change, we're going to have an anti-clockwise rotation, and this is going to help compensate on the nose. We're going to have more mandibular protrusion or projection and less impact on the nose. So this is something which is key, the uh, occlusal plane um, centering of the occlusal plane optimization, and then we perform a genoplasty in, in the particular patient. Now, you see that the mandible is of a triangular shape. So when it moves forward, it's go you're going to have a conflict with the condyles. This is something that you could not anticipate when you worked in 2D and previously. This we can see. We can see the um, bony interferences. Now, there are many softwares out there. You can have before and after simulations of both soft tissues. This is not something that uh, I show to my patients. It is not advisory to, to, to show that to them because it would be too much uh, to 
to understand. But that's interesting. You can anticipate how the face is going to to change. Some simulations are very nice. You have very nice uh, videos uh, by Global D that you find on YouTube, and you can have interesting videos. Those videos you can show to your patients. Patients understand that from a class two to class one, their face is going to change, and you don't need to show them the simulation on their face, so that it's not too uh, that there are no, not too many strings attached to your result. Now, we simulate the surgical splint for mandibular advancement. When I used to be a, 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 a resident, it used to be very complicated. Now, it is a lot easier with uh, those digital tools. This is the intermediate splint and the final splint of final guide. And we're going to print those three devices. Now, about in-house and in-office, what you print in office is a class one medical device. So you should be declared at the National Agency for Drugs, the French National Agency for Drugs, and we you're supposed to follow a number of protocols. So I had a look in depth at the regulations that we are supposed to comply with. We could have a talk about this later after my presentation. You should have a, a, a trackability system. You should use a, a CE marked machines, etc. So there are a number of constraints. So this is result post-surgery. We were able to improve the vertical dimension. The maxilla is more centered. We manage the uh, gummy smile. And you see that the uh, lower third of the face has been improved. We were able to improve the aesthetic dimension, but also to help with uh, sleep apnea. Now I'm going to show you the second type of device, so guides and customized plates. High mandibular angle, open bite, you see that you still have mandibles on the uh, lower incisors, which means that there's been an open bite for a long time. So also she doesn't use, she doesn't bite with her front teeth, so she will need to see a physiotherapist and she will need to learn how to use all her teeth properly. So that was a quick reminder. You see that the maxilla is tilted, the occlusal plane is tilted, to one side, so we change that in order to uh, correct that anterior open bite. So this is a clockwise rotation of the occlusal plan, and uh, we want to improve lip competency, and we uh, will perform a genoplasty in order to improve with the muscle uh, on the uh, at, at the chin level. Now, those plates, um, you can be very creative. We can really ask for the manufacturing of customized, really bespoke plates. Uh, some are placed on the anterior side of the maxilla, and that way my cut is really limited. I do not have to uh, elevate too much of the flap, and this comes with uh, a less um, difficult post-operative phase for this patient as a, an aside. In 2013, so more than well, 10 years ago, President Obama was the first president printing his uh, bust or uh, his uh, emblem in 3D. And this was to say that the next industrial revolution was 3D printing. You may say, oh, that's very American, it's an exaggeration, it's all for show. But when you look at those machines that we have now, um, uh, what we can do uh, with uh, en this uh, engineer, uh, this is a uh, 3D printing machine for titanium printing. Well, obviously, it's not an in-office machine, it's huge. But titanium printing is selective titanium uh, sintering. So you do have a laser beam, which is really going to uh, merge that and, and really sinter powder of titanium, and you're going to create uh, your objects. So those are the plates that we receive from the external lab that uh, we work with. And you can see the... Uh, a connection here between what Obama said and those objects in the past, those are artifacts from uh, uh, ancient times, uh, which were done in a very craftsman type of way, while on the right you do have those things which were 
printed, so it's a complete revolution. This patient uh, one week later and six months after surgery. Now, transversal dimension, we can also print uh, bespoke uh, bone supported discussion device. It's not very widely used, but it can be very helpful in some cases. Now, before I conclude my last clinical case, he was uh, treated by Dr. Le Breton with uh, the genius system. So tooth number 21 is missing and therefore number 11 migrated towards the center of the face. You can see a tilting of the occlusion plate to the left and there's a rather gummy smile. High mandibular angle, class 2, vertical dimension on the posterior segment is of course uh, uh, reduced. From a dental point of view, so 21 is missing, number 11 is in the center, and you have lots of crowding in the lower arch. Two options here for treatment. Either we open a space um, and uh, for 21 and we propose a bonded bridge, or you change 21 in 11, 23 change in uh, 22, so you change the shape, and then you provide a um, prosthesis or, or of the knees. So this is what we did, and we extracted 34 and 44. Now, this is um, ongoing treatment, huge amelioration, improvement of his smile, this is also, there was also an improvement in the general oral hygiene and state, and this is the uh, decompensation which we obtained in the lower arch thanks to the two avulsions of 34 and 44, as I said before. The decompensation, which we think is very important because thanks to that we are going to be able to move the mandible forward. So again, we planned on our computer, we recentered the uh, maxilla. So that tool really changed uh, the way we work. It's very difficult freehand to place the inter incisor milestone in the center of the face, especially in this patient. His uh, nose septum was deviated, and so freehand it would have been very hard to place the um, inter incisor point right in the middle of his face. So this is a picture taken last week, a few weeks after surgery, we centered the uh, maxilla, so we centered the upper arch, the maxilla, uh, also we performed a septoplasty in order to get the nose in the right axis, so we have a very nice alignment and centering of the smile. And side view, we have a, 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 a more um, a decent uh, angle between the chin and the neck. Now, by means of conclusion, of course, everything is based on diagnosis. Irrespective of a tool you use, you need to have a very good collaboration between the surgeon and the orthodontist. I have to say that my life changed from the moment I started using those tools on um, those digital tools. They are more accurate. Of course, you need to um, get your hand on them, you need to understand the limits, and of course, also, you need to work in a multidisciplinary team in between the orthodontist and the surgeon. Thank you very much for your attention.